from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. I'm Maureen Corrigan. I'm the book critic for Fresh Air on NPR, and I also write for uh, the Washington Post. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. The Washington Post has been a proud sponsor of the National Book Festival for all of its nine years. It is really my honor this afternoon to introduce Lisa Scottolini to you. I love her books and I admire her books. Many years ago, Book World, the late lamented Book World, yeah, asked its readers this great question in a holiday issue. They posed the question, if you could have any writer write the novel of your life, which writer would you choose? And I've been thinking about that question for years. You know, Dickens, definitely. Mary Shelley, I don't know. <laughs> I finally settled on Lisa Scottolini. And, and those of you who love her books, you know why. First of all, she'd imbue your life with a, with a lot of suspenseful twists and turns. She tells the truth of contemporary women's lives, and I really value that. And she also would endow your life with this great comic vision. Could you ask for more? I don't think so. Her latest book is called Look Again. It follows, what, 15 previous novels which have won more awards and topped more bestseller lists than I can name. I told Lisa earlier today that Look Again is one of the only mysteries I can think of where I actually did that thing where you turn to the back to find out how it ends because it's so suspenseful that I needed to know before I could keep on reading it. I'm thrilled that the sound is working again so that you can hear Lisa and it is my pleasure to introduce her to you, Lisa Scottolini. Thank you for that. Oh, I love Maureen Corrigan. Let's hear it for Maureen. And if you haven't read her book, Leave Me Alone, I'm Reading, <laughs> she is, it's terrific. Um, thank you for this. Thank you to the Washington Post. I, it's so wonderful that you support this festival. Thank you to the Library of Congress who busts their ass. That's a literary term if you have a, Everyone working so, so hard, tons of volunteers to bring this to you. So I'm very, very grateful and very, very honored. And plus I have like this hot guy signing. <laughs> now we're having fun. <laughs> well, I thought as usual, I would tell you some silly stories and then try to tell you something important. I wonder if that part is possible. But I think I want to start with a thank you. It's a thank you to librarians. Boy, oh boy, oh boy. I owe you big time. I grew up in a wonderful house in South Philly, you know by my accent, and my really large nose. As my mother said, we get more oxygen than you. If I breathe in, you can't. <laughs> but I didn't, in my house, we had lots of love and lots of meatballs and one book. What was the book? The Bible. The Bible. Aren't you sweet? No. <laughs> How do you sign no? No. No Bible. The book was TV Guide. <laughs> we didn't read. We watch TV, which is great. I was the kid who like my mother would say, stop reading, it will ruin your eyes. And she was right, but I didn't stop reading. If it weren't for a librarian and tons of librarians, I would not be standing before you. I discovered books in the school library where I found that not only were they all, you know, like a little bit bigger than I thought and they didn't have Lucille Ball on the cover, which was, Excellent. And I was that kid wandering around the stacks thinking, why can I only take out 12? And you know, that was in the days, I'll take you back, because I'm 54, oh yes. How do you sign 54? 
No. You, that's how you sign 54. No. I'm kid. Um, back then, I went to the library and I didn't know how to choose a book because my dad, God bless him, brought me to the library and sat in the car and waited like a dog because why would he go in the library? Because there's no TV. Now there's TV. He would go to the library. But then I'm so morning around trying to figure out what, to, what should I read? Well, you know, you, that was the days going back when uh, the card, do you remember the card in back actually stayed with the same book? God bless us. And you could go, well, I'd look at the handwriting. of. The, she seems nice. This must be a good book. Or look at all these signatures. This must be a really good book. Or if you're me, you start to look at those spines. Now on the spine, there was a picture of a guy with a really big nose and a hat. And I'm like, that looks like my Uncle Rocky. I think I will read these Uncle Rocky books. And then I got older and I found out that the guy was not Uncle Rocky, but Sherlock Holmes. And uh, I think that's why I'm a mystery writer. But the real important thing that a library did and librarians did for me is this, and I want to take you back for a minute. Because do you remember your first library card? I do. You don't know where your car keys are, do you? But you know what your library card looked like. Mine was orange and small and it had a metal plate and it had numbers. And when I would go home from the library, because they would have inked it up, you could press your thumb onto it and mine was 3937. Why do I remember that? The answer is simple. If you think back to when you were little, and you know everybody else had dri driver's licenses and credit cards and they got mail. Do you remember when you wanted mail? Wow, you know, so you got mail. Well, I think that what happens to a kid, or at least what happened to me, was that that library card is the first piece of identification you get in life. And if you're a kid like me, where the family loves you, but no one at home is saying reading is a good thing at all, you think, I read, therefore I matter. The, I am among people, as I am now today, who love books. We all make our little families as we get older, and as wonderful as my meatball-loving family was, the family that loved books is just as terrific. And it was libraries that gave that to me. And they give that to all of us. I think they give it to all of you. They build community for you. The Library of Congress is building a national community where the dialogue is about how important books are. And it isn't that reading is fundamental, which they, I hate that. I mean, can we do better? Really, because reading is connects people. Reading nurtures us. Reading enriches us. That's why book clubs work. You know, I, I, I think about fiction, and I'm getting off point, but in fiction, what I real they'll call them thrillers. They'll call them, they'll put covers. On the cover, there's legs. There's always legs. Legs sell things. I don't know why. Because they're the last to go. But I am opening my heart in these books. These books I think of as stories about ordinary women, and I always think of that great quote by Alice, Alice Roosevelt, Eleanor Roosevelt, thinking of her niece, which was, a woman is like a tea bag. You never know how strong she is until she's in hot water. Isn't that what I write? Isn't that what I write? Let's hear it for tea bags. It's all Nancy Drew, only in better clothes. <laughs> and with a car and still not with a boyfriend. How do you sign still not with a boyfriend? <laughs> I might be in love. <laughs> where do you get your ideas? Here's where you get your ideas if you're a tea bag. One is a memory. I'm walking with my mom. I'm seven. We're in South Philly, a mythical place. A car pulls up, curvy, big, big, uh, you know. <laughs> bumpers, bumpers. And a convertible, the woman behind the wheel, pop, 
piles of black hair, black, black eyebrows, red, red lips, dramatic. I'm seven, I remember this person like it was yesterday. I'm walking with my mother. My mother sees the driver, she says, oh, watch this. She walks over to the car. The woman driver cranks the window up in her face. My mother comes back to the curb laughing. I say, who was that? She says, that was my sister. <laughs> I can't believe this. Now I'm gonna tell you now. I told this today, so I have to tell it. This is embarrassing because I want you to be impressed by me. That's why I wore the underwire. But <laughs> the real truth. Shameless. I've lost it, haven't I? The real truth is that my mother is the youngest of 19 children. Yeah, and she didn't even have her, like, a reality show for it. <laughs> They're just good Catholics, really good Catholics. We always say that there were two husbands and the first one died, and you know how. Okay, so I have a lot of aunts and uncles, but I thought I knew all my aunts and uncles until that day, and I said to my mother, well, how can that be your sister? That's your Aunt Lena, we don't speak. We haven't spoken in 17 and a half years. Really, why? Because she brought a gun to a wedding, her daughter's wedding. I'm like, okay, enough, TMI, too much information. So at some point recently, I start to go, that, that could be a novel. And that becomes a vendetta defense. Because it's about a family feud and you don't have to be Italian to have a blood feud, damn it. <laughs> right? It just comes from life. Everything, another time, all right. I, there is a knock at the door, to make a long story short. A woman is there looking a lot like me and she says, hi, I'm your half-sister and I really love your books. I'm like, really? <laughs> Come in. And then she tells a story, because I'm looking at her, and her blue eyes are my father's eyes. And, you know, I kind of always wanted a sister, but I never thought that past age 35 I would get one. I mean, I wanted a pony too, but I bought that. <laughs> and I say, gee, who now look? Come in. She said, well, you're fine. This is kind of dirty laundry <laughs> broadcast in the national. Isn't it kind of? Oh. <laughs> Why do I start and then want to stop? Um, she says, well, actually what happened is your father is my birth father. Uh, he had an affair when he went to University of California at Berkeley, which is just where that would happen. Because if you stayed in Philadelphia, you would actually, you know, behave yourself. But if you go to Berkeley, you're going to lose it. And the child's produced, and she's a wonderful kid. And before you feel sorry for her, she had a wonderful adoptive experience, and I got the crazy Scottolinis. Okay, but here she comes back and she wants, she finds me because his name's on the birth certificate and your mouth is hanging open, it's scary. <laughs> and the bottom line is I grew up thinking that, you know, in my family, blood and tomato sauce are very thick. But when this woman walks into my life, I realize I'm looking at family and she is a complete and total stranger to me. And the experience I had that year was that I was found when I didn't know I was lost. And I said, that's a book. And it became mistaken identity. Where I had an evil twin, because of course if your half-sister comes into your life, oh, you're gonna make her evil. <laughs> uh, that's the payback. And the funny thing is her name is Jean, so my brother likes to call her Jean Poole. <laughs> that's a great line. I should have thought of that line. And the funny thing is it like, um, you know, to, to, to go off track for a minute, because my daughter is here today, the lovely Francesca. And uh, yeah, let's hear it. Um, she was younger then. So you can imagine that I, because as soon as this woman came into my life, I mean, I did always want a sister, and she's a terrific person. And I thought, well, we're going to embrace her, right? I mean, I embrace anybody. If you were in my book signing line, you know that. I might have tried to force my tongue into your mouth. In fact, it's. <laughs> I'm grateful to you is what I mean to say. How did he sign the tongue part? <laughs> All right. No, I totally forget where I am. But I said, well, you're going to be embraced, and we're going to introduce you. I have to introduce you to my daughter. Now, listen, the only other family secret we had is that I have a brother whose name is Frank, and he's gay, which is not a secret because he always liked us to call him Aunt Frank. 
Oh, you can't make it up. So imagine the time I have to sit my daughter down and say to her, you know how you thought your only aunt was Frank? It's confusing. It's confusing. But it's good for more than one book. And it became Dead Ringer. Because I said to Jeannie, you know what, now as we come to know each other and love each other, and I go, Jeannie, you had a wonderful adoptive experience. What if you had been adopted by a horror show family and you came to find me and I look like I had it all together and my own personal super hot signer and, you know, <laughs> wouldn't, wouldn't you be jealous? She's like, no, I wouldn't. I'd be and meanwhile, of course, we are night and day. I mean, it's a bad Patty Duke episode, right? She has like, she's married to the same guy for like longer than 20 minutes, which for me is incredible. <laughs> he built their house. I'm divorced twice. I got my roots done for the book festival. <laughs> I'm hitting on the signer. What? <laughs> As I was saying, So that stuff is all taken from my life. The book Look Again is too, although it's just a moment. And I want to take you to that moment because I think lots of people have moments like this. I mean, if you get nothing from this book festival, it's that it all just comes from our hearts. The authors really are open books. You know, there's a great quote by Francis Ford Coppola. He said, and I think it's true about fiction. You know, fiction is about truth. Everybody who writes fake stories is trying to write something true. And when we do, it connects to you. Francis Ford Coppola's quote is, nothing in this movie happened. Everything is true. So, look again. Came out of a situation where I'm driving home from, from college with my daughter. And now, have you done the thing where you have to pack the kid into the car? You have to pack an entire room? Yeah, right, I know. And if you have a, okay, if, you have, if you're the parent of a son, you can't whine right now. Because I've seen you guys pack. It's a basketball, it's a Nintendo system. Okay, if you have a girl, like I do, shoes, clothes, books, CDs, and Sex in the City in triplicate, Okay, we packed the car up. I'm getting her in. I got, we have a mattress and a box spring, and we have it on the roof of the car. And on top of that, we have this filthy, disgusting, cheap-ass red rug that I bought her. I'm such a sport. It's like a $35 rug, but she wants to save it. I'm like, okay. We put that on top of the mattress, and we're going to drive home from Boston to Philly. In Connecticut, the storm breaks. People are pointing and laughing by Greenwich, as they would be. I'm driving this thing that looks like the blood mobile. <laughs> See, you get it. Because the red is leeching all over the car, my gorgeous white car, which is mommy's mothership. It's Nancy Drew, right? And, I can't, and we just start to laugh. You know, we just laugh, because there's really nothing else you can do. And I thought to myself, and we talk about it, and I say, you know, this is a moment. I'm not going to have these times with my daughter who insists on growing up. And, you know, there's a joke about Italian mothers, which is, what is the difference between an Italian mother and a Rottweiler? And the answer is, eventually, the Rottweiler lets go. <laughs> and it's true. But I don't think it's just about Italians for once. I think it is really about being a parent. However you come to it, however you find it, it's hard to let them go. And I thought, you know, we're in the car, and I thought, you know, I could think about this differently if I just don't think that I, I think I own her, and that's why I'm asking myself the question of letting her go. But the truth is, I don't. I just get to be with her for a while, and it's the best thing that ever happened to me. It's true. And every bear, <laughs> they start crying. <gasps> I have no estrogen left and I'm weeping. It's, it's leaching out my tear ducts. Um, but I thought, think about this differently. Who really owns a child? And so that's what Look Again's about. Look Again is none, nothing in that book happened, but everything is true. 
The woman, a woman comes home Sunday, just an ordinary person like all of us, on her mail is one of those sad, uh, you probably get them too, have you seen this child flyer? And she looks down at the picture in the middle and she has an adopted child and the picture in the middle looks exactly like her adopted child. And so the question is, if that's really her child, is she gonna keep him or is she gonna give him up? What would you do? And that's how the book starts. I can't tell you how it ends. There's romance. There's a sex scene I wrote from memory. <laughs> and now I don't remember. <laughs> or stop me before I tell really bad jokes. So, but the, the point is this, and then I'll open it to questions. We are all of us trying to connect with you. That's why, you know, people today say, wow, you must, you know, there's a big long line and that must, you must be tired. I'm like, are you kidding? This is my life stream. Because what, when I think about why I write, it's the same reason that I read. It's to connect. And I truly didn't figure that out actually until after 9-11. When I started to read like a fiend, I just was like crazy with the reading. And I thought, you know, people say conventionally about reading that it, it helps you escape. I think that is completely wrong. Because if, where's the Latin? Who had Latin? Who took Latin? God bless us. So you know the Latin comes from X, the X escape is X, emotion away to, from something. But I think reading is emotion toward something. And that's what I think I was doing, and I think that's what we are all doing, trying to get to each other, and in a way, trying to connect with ourselves. That's what they do in book clubs, right? The first three minutes is about this in the book, club, in the book and, and the rest is, well, I like this character in the daughter because my own daughter, and blah, 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 right? Books are connecting each other and they connect us all today. And that's why I'm so thrilled that we have a national book festival. And that's why I'm so thrilled that you all are here to support it. So thank you. To you. Now, we have time for questions. Any questions? Yes. I'll repeat it if you start, if you say it. Hi, um, I do miss Benny. Do you have any plans on, br on bringing Benny and her fellow um, lawyers back again? The question is, is Benny coming back? The answer is absolutely. <laughs> um, I just finished the, that book, All of Rosado Associates coming back two days ago. And then I got to get my roots done and come to the National Book Festival. <laughs> so thank you. My question is, what's your process for writing? Process? Yeah, I mean, do you get up in the morning? Or work, work, work. Or... Yes. Here's my process. Right? You know me now. Right? Okay, so do I seem real organized to you? <laughs> Clearly. Thank you. Answer. The process is I just get up, and I have no idea where it's going to go. I don't know what it's about. When I look again, had the idea, started writing, Hope that, you know, they say, do you know the end? No. Do you know how it ends? No, I don't know how it middles. I'm convinced like the surprise ending is like a surprise to me. I'm like, that might not be what they meant by it, but it's, it's kind of true. So the process is you just work like a fiend. Where did you go? I want to see you. You just work like a fiend until you get to the end. Thank you. My girl. Hello again. New work. <laughs> um, so... Everyone, at least one person has asked this of every presentation I've been to today, but what tips do you have for an aspiring writer? Good. That's an excellent question. What tips do you have for aspiring writers? You know, this is embarrassing too, but do you know what the tip I tell myself is? I borrowed it from the great literary philosopher, Nike, who makes sneakers. <laughs> it is just do it. it is really, you know, everybody before you that comes here and stands here and gets all this cool stuff happening is unpublished, was unpublished once. And I have an unpublished book at home. No one thinks it's very good. Well, they didn't then, now they might, if I could find it, which would be great. But <laughs> it really is something you just have to do. There are some problems that you will behave your way out of, and this is one of them. That if you just sit down, whatever amount of time you have, and just keep at it, it will come out. It's true of any kind of writing. I should mention, I am, you see, I like to laugh. And one of the things I'm doing, you can see them for free on my website, Scott Alini, is I started to write a humor column for the National, in for the National Enquirer. 
I'm so literary. <laughs> Not that I would ever read the National Enquirer. But I totally read the National Enquirer. But um, no, for the Philadelphia Enquirer. And it's really just about my life. Francesca writes some of the columns too. And they're going to be in a book this Thanksgiving. The title is Why My Third Husband Will Be a Dog. <laughs> <laughs> now, here's my point. I didn't know how to write newspaper columns because I only write 90,000 words, not 700. I cannot even say hello in 700 words, as you see. But I said, you just got to start trying. And if you look at the columns from the beginning, they're not as good as they get later. So I think, I think that is really true. Writing does improve and you should just try. Yes, please. Uh, I just wanted to ask how little Tony was. I loved your article and your <laughs> newsletter. Thank you. The question is, how's my puppy? Which is really sad and boring for the rest of you with no idea what I'm talking about. Um, I don't, I, he's great. I have to, you know, it's at some point I have to, um, I decided that like pets are a love you can buy. And, and there's really nothing wrong with that, damn it. And it, <laughs> as long as you're not trying to like nurse them or anything, <laughs> it's okay to have a little puppy and cuddle it right up. Yes, please, get me out of this. <laughs> Ask me about imagery or something like that that makes me sound smarter. Yes, please. Who does your roots? <laughs> That's so cool. Oh, J. Michael Salon and Bella came with. I'm like, a, the, the door. How many women here have someone... Okay, here's the real question. How many women here have a longer relationship with their hairdresser than their husband. <laughs> I looked at my hair color lady, I'm going, she has seen me through two divorces, seven dogs, and a pony. That's... <laughs> Thank you, though. Last question. Yeah. What gave you the idea to take uh, the novel plot into Centralia, Pennsylvania? Oh, thank you for that. The question is, why did you use Centralia, Pennsylvania in a book? I'll tell you why. Because even though I joke around, I kind of do, I kind of take the job seriously. <laughs> Sounds great, doesn't it? Get Pelicanos back here. <laughs> but I think the most important thing in life is other people. And so I think the most important thing in a book is the character. And sometimes I try to do things that will tell you something about the character without hitting you over the head with it. Because I think you're really smart. And I never, I always have that in mind. And so Centralia, Pennsylvania, briefly, is a place where I had driven through it once. And it is actually the site of what happened in the 60s was there had been mines underground, coal mines, and somebody dropped something in a hole on the top of the surface. It burned through the underground mine starting in 1967, and it is burning still today. And I, wa and I did all this research, and I went there. And you can when you go there in the wintertime, noxious fumes come up through the earth like ghosts if there's snow. If you stick your hand under the snow, the snow next to the earth is hot. It's almost like boiling water. When you go to the cemetery in Centralia, I'm there when there's mourners there. They have people buried underground. You get where I'm going with this. It's kind of, ew, yes, another literary term. It's ew. <laughs> Do tongue and then ew. <laughs> it's kind of like a rock concert. I love it. <laughs> so that's what I wanted to use because that was like this character. I said, this woman will have grown up in Centralia. We all love where we're from. And we carry it with us. And I always think about what forms us, and part of that is where we're from. And so where we, if your hometown were eaten alive by an underground fire, and by the way, your local government did nothing to stop it, your state government did nothing to stop it, and your federal government was like, you know, checking its watch too, and everything you own and love is destroyed thereby, aren't you going to be kind of have an underground fire of your own? That's why it's in Centralia. Last question. We have two minutes. Any other extremely personal questions? I'd love to answer. You know how I am. 
Yes. Uh, just a quick question. Yes. I was wondering, uh, with your work being out there for everybody to read, everybody to judge, how do you, uh, let's say when you wrote your first book, how did you think you would deal with anybody who had anything bad to say, bearing yourself to everybody to read? Question is, how do you deal when you know you're going to lay your soul bare and somebody's going to say mean things? And that does happen. And you see me. You think I'm a baby and cry? Absolutely. I cry, cry, cry. These people who say, like, they don't read the reviews, I memorize my reviews. <laughs> I think you can learn from reviewers when they hate you and when they love you. But the truth is, and this is a, it's a good way to leave you with this thought, if you're trying to get to something true and real, people tell when there's a false note. Can't you kind of tell when someone's lying? You know, if you're going to really just open it up and tell it, there's going to be people who are not going to like it. But the truth that I found, and I sort of like do this kind of, I thought of it like a literary mosh pit. If I just go, here I am, people catch you. Some people will be over there going, oh, another story about the underwire. But some, there's a, there are more people going, Oh, and that's what's so great. You know, when you think about novels, and I read all the time, and you should read everything. I mean, you see wonderful authors at this thing. The truth is, when I was coming up as an English major, everybody had in mind you should write the great American novel. There's Saul Bellow, Philip, Ma Philip Roth wrote a novel called The Great American Novel. He's a terrific writer. But I think, frankly, that that was the wrong thing to want. I think that was more about being the coolest, the mostest, the biggest, the one they love the best. The truth is, this country is about diversity to me. And when you think about what the forefathers imagined the First Amendment, which is the First Amendment for a reason, it wasn't a single voice that dominates. It was a multiplicity of voices. And that's what novels are. When you go to the wonderful Library of Congress, which I can't believe is here for free to walk around in, when you're in any library, when you're in any bookstore, you will see an array of voices. And that's why we, that's why you should just do it. Because we need all those voices. That's what America is about. And that's why there's a National Book Festival. And that's why I think you're here. And I am very, very grateful. Thank you very much. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.